I said I'm in the sports business, and what does that mean? It, uh, I think the the way when team owners view you know what kind of assets they have have evolved over time. Uh, I think traditionally sports is uh, you know if you own a team, it's a very localized business. Uh, so if we own a team in Brooklyn, we try to get Brooklyn fans. Uh, if you are LA, you get uh, you know LA fans, or if you're in Cleveland, you know you're just a Cleveland team. But over time. Uh, sports has become a national business. If you look at the structure of the NBA, the economics of the NBA is that roughly half of the economics come from national TV. Uh, so, as one of the 30 team owners in the NBA, I actually have nothing to do with negotiating the national TV contracts, and I just, uh, you know, leave it to to the league. Adam Silver, the league commissioner, and his team. Negotiates with ESPN, TNT. So then you ask, well, what do the team owners do? Well, we are uh, responsible for the local uh, part of our business, which is to get to get fans into the arena. We have 18,000 uh, seats in Barclays Center. Uh, we have to fill the center uh, every game, hopefully, uh, charge for tickets. We also have local TV, which is uh, we, we're being broadcast on the Yes Network, which is a local. Regional Sports Network, or short is RSN. You, you might hear this word being thrown around, RSNs, uh, as distinguished from national TV, cable TV, ESPN, or even broadcast when they put the games on ABC. So that's that's kind of the structure, half and half. But over the last year or two years, I've seen how this business. Evolve, running into sort of three emerging trends. In fact, a lot of these trends are not just emerging; they're like right here, right now, with us. The number one trend is digital media, the rise of digital media. So today,、um, I think most of you probably don't have your parents have cable subscriptions, but you don't have cable subscriptions, and you are consuming sports content on the internet. You may not be watching a full game. You may be watching just highlights on Instagram or whatever. So the the whole phenomenon of、uh, digital media is continuing to rise, and you we will see more and more viewers、uh, consuming sports content on digital. The other trend that we're seeing is the whole idea of how you present the sport to how people. Use sports content to entertain themselves. So I call this gamification. So either you are playing a, a game like NBA 2K, you're gamifying the NBA game, or you're betting on sports. So betting is part of gamification. And the third trend we're seeing is that、uh, any of you into blockchains, blockchains,、uh, cryptocurrency, and all that stuff. That's a emerging trend that will have. Great applications in sports. So today's session is about digital media. I've broken this uh, uh, series of classes into three se sessions. So that's today, and then the next、uh, week is、uh, October 12th. I will be talking about gamification, sports betting,、uh, and then the third session I'll be talking about crypto blockchain applications. All right. So this is kind of a visual of of、uh, you know how we see things and. Of course, you know I want to put myself in the best position as the owner of sports. I don't own a team. I really own intellectual property. I own the IP,、uh, or I'm one of the owners.、Uh, you know, if you talk about the NBA, I'm one of the 30 owners that collectively own this IP called NBA and NBA games and things like that. So we're, you know, we like to see ourselves in the center. This is maybe a very self-centered view, but surrounding、uh, the ecosystem, we have digital content, digital media. Uh, we have gamification, and then we have blockchain. Some of the recent trends are interesting. This shows the big four sports league. That's NFL, NBA, NHL, and Major League Baseball. The value of their content. In other words, I believe this is a、uh, the value of just the national、uh, content. So what the NBA sells to ESPN, NFL sells to Fox, ABC, CBS. That value has been rising. Uh, dramatically, you know, well, not so dramatically, but it's been rising eight percent a year. Kager, that's not bad. And uh, you know, uh, now close to eleven, around eleven billion dollars in aggregate of、uh, TV rights revenue. Okay, 
and it's going to go higher even. I will talk a little bit about the recent NFL case study. Here we have sports betting and the, uh, the cryptocurrency world. The, uh, the way you know, most people in the industry in sports betting look at it as a net revenue concept, that's how much, uh, how much you collect from the bettors uh, minus what you pay out. So that left-hand side chart is uh, what they call the GGR, right? Rich, what does GGR stand for? Gross gaming revenue. Gross gaming revenue. That's great. By the way, Rich Tao, who uh, works, uh, who is my partner in our uh, family investment office, uh, he's been intimately involved in the transaction when we acquired the Nets. He's also helping me out in, in lacrosse and everything. So he's going to be our teaching assistant. In fact, it's all of his work. I, you know, take no credit. So I'm just sort of parroting what he's telling me to say. Uh, I'll defer to Rich uh, if, I, if I can't uh, explain something. And uh, so gross gaming revenue has dramatically increased by, by a lot. And uh, this is because... I'll cover this a little bit more in the next, next session. This is because there was a Supreme Court case about three years ago uh, when uh, uh, New Jersey wanted to legalize sports gambling, and they went to the Supreme Court and challenged a federal law that would have prohibited uh, all the states from deciding on their own s sports gambling uh, statutes. The Supreme Court struck down the federal law and uh, uh, that enabled each state to write their own sports betting laws. And now, state by state, I think right now, especially you know, with COVID, uh, all the states are basically bankrupt and they need to have generate more revenues. So there's a very positive inclination from state legislatures to put in uh, positive legislation to allow sports betting. Okay, so that's, that's why the, the gross gaming revenues have, uh, have increased on, in, in sports betting. And then the third uh, phenomenon is this blockchain, uh, the rise of blockchain applications. And now that's the biggest representation of sort of uh, the value of blockchain is the value of cryptocurrencies that's being traded in the marketplace. Today, I believe, I think this is probably an underestimate of uh, how big the size of the crypto market is. I think the crypto market, if you look at aggregate all the values of all the cryptocurrencies is about $2 trillion in value uh, today. So that's really um, uh, quite a uh, large increase over the last several years. Uh, so, and as a result, the value of sports teams, which, is, which directly benefits me, right? You know, because of all these trends, people are seeing the potential of the teams that own the IP to monetize that IP beyond just selling tickets and selling to TV. Uh, they see potential in sports betting, they see potential in blockchain applications, and we anticipate, this is just historically, team values have gone up uh, pretty, pretty fast, but uh, we think in the future, uh, sports team values are going to increase uh, even more, uh, even accelerate. So today, the subject is TV, OTT, uh, media, uh, and the, the rise of digital media. So I want to just spend some time to cover some trends and what's been happening in the whole media landscape relating to sports. First of all, today's landscape looks like this. It's actually a three-legged stool uh, of the sports media ecosystem. We have uh, the sports leagues, you know, NFL, NBA, uh, that basically organize the content. We don't necessarily create the content in the sense that we, don't, may, we may not show up with a camera. The leagues, although the league does some production, uh, but you know, most of the time, what our job is actually as the organizer. You know, uh, one of the 30 teams in the NBA, I make sure we put together the most competitive team in the league and sign big stars and you know, extend them, make sure that we are, uh, we're gonna be competitive. And that's, that's what we do. And uh, when you look at the NBA as a construct, it is nothing but a large number of very complicated contracts. It's very, very legal, legally driven. Uh, but the contracts spell out your rights, your responsibilities, and all of that. And out of this sort of bundle of contracts, and all of a sudden, you know, you create a league that has a lot of value. And that's because 
they've become very thoughtful about the relationship between teams and players, and also the relationship between uh, among teams, among the team owners. How do you share the economics? Roughly speaking, the NBA shares economics between teams and players on a 50-50 basis. So any kind of revenues that they, the t technical term is called basketball-related income, BRI. Any kind of uh, revenues that come in, uh, minus some expenses, uh, is, you know, that number is share 50-50 with the players. But that's just an aggregate number, right? Not every player gets to share the same proportion of that 50%. Uh, you have rookies that get paid rookie scale. You have big stars like LeBron James that gets paid over $40 million a year. So, that's, uh, so there's actually some disparity within, within the players. But at, in aggregate, the league owners and the players get, share, get to share the economics 50-50. The other economic sharing is that among the league owners, we get to keep our local revenues. Like if I sell tickets in Barclays Center, I get to keep all that revenue. Uh, well, I have, there's a small tax. I have to pay 6% to the NBA, but that's net, not, you know, we don't need to pay attention to that. So I get to keep the local revenues, but anything that's national or international, the revenue gets split uh, 1 30th each to each team, so equally. Uh, very kind of socialist, if you think about it. So, for example, if uh, uh, take international revenues as an example, if someone from China buys a Kevin Durant jersey, says Brooklyn Nets Kevin Durant, right? The NBA gets a royalty from Nike, or whoever makes the jersey. Uh, that revenue comes back to the league and is shared equally among all 30 teams. But I'm like, wait a minute, Kevin Durant is on our team, so why should I share the revenue with, they said, that's the deal, that's the lead, you sign up for this deal. So, so it's a way for the NBA to create parity so that each team can get some of the economics of the entire league. And uh, uh, again, another example is, uh, you know, the NBA has a very large contract with Tencent, which is a streaming media company in China. Uh, and Tencent Video shows NBA games, streams M NBA games, and pays hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And guess what? You know, because the Nets are getting, becoming more popular uh, in China, they probably show more Nets games than they show Cleveland Cavaliers games, right? But all of that revenue comes back to the league, gets shared evenly across all owners. So there's a way of sort of spreading the wealth uh, evenly between owners and players and also among team owners. Uh, anyway, that's a digression. Uh, has nothing to do with the media's, th I, well, you know, something to do with media, but I just want you to understand kind of the fundamentals of the NBA business. So in this ecosystem, the media e ecosystem, we, we have the leagues that own the IP, and then you have these uh, sports uh, networks. ESPN is the primary example. Um, what they do is they go out and aggregate all sports content, right? Uh, and then they have uh, shows like Sports Center that could help promote the content when they're not showing live games. And that's why they're valuable. And they have become one of the most valuable assets within the, ESPN is owned by Disney, so they've become one of the most valuable assets within the Disney empire. And then the other uh, sports networks are, you know, uh, TBS is Turner Broadcasting, uh, Fox, NBC, and et cetera. They're the bro broadcast networks. But these guys, you know, aggregate all the content, but they have a problem. On TV, they don't have access to the end consumer. So when you're sitting at home watching TV, you're not subscribing to ESPN. You're actually a subscriber to cable. You have to, you know, link up to your local cable company, who we call the distributors. So they actually distribute the content to the end consumers. Uh, so you know, some of these guys are telcos like Verizon, AT and T, uh, and then they have uh, you know satellite players like Directv, Dish Networks, uh, also cable company Comcast. I don't know what the cable company is in Connecticut, but M Michael, do you Comcast? Comcast? Okay. All right, Comcast, and uh, uh, Charter, et cetera. So in a way, if you think about it, it's kind of silly that 
you know, if I view myself as a team owner and I own the content, to reach my end customer, I've got to go through like three, two layers of uh, middlemen, if you think about it. And the whole digital world is coming in to disrupt this ecosystem, as you can see. So what's happening is, because you guys, how many of you still watch cable TV? Or, all right, one, one or two, right? See Coach Jones in the back? <laughs> you, you still watch cable? You're still watching? You're the traditional cable guy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the traditional pay TV in the United States, number of households has come down. It peaked uh, sort of around 2010, around 100, 100 million households. Now it's you know, less than 80 million households. So if you look at this picture here, on the other hand, uh, OTT, we say OTT, which means over the top. The network is directly reaching the consumer. So who are the OTT players? Some of them are not in sports yet, but I think they will. Like Netflix, Amazon Video, Amazon Video just recently got into sports because they signed a uh, Thursday night NFL Thursday night contract. And then we have uh, Paramount, HBO, Hulu, Disney Plus, right? And it, it's it, very interesting that Disney Plus also owns Hulu, also owns ESPN. So they, they ha they're very, well, it's wrong to say they're confused, no, but I think they are trying to figure out their strategy, what their strategy is, because they have linear TV, cable TV, uh, broadcast network like ABC, but they also have a very strong uh, digital offering in Disney Plus and ESPN Plus, which the Ivy League is on ESPN Plus. I think you can watch all the Ivy League lacrosse games on ESPN Plus. So the rise of uh, OTT is definitely coming. I mean, you know, in the future, you'll see a lot more people deciding not to uh, continue their cable subscription and just uh, you know, buy an ESPN Plus subscription or something like that. So I think the biggest challenge, if you are ESPN, you're trying to figure out, right now my most premium content, like if I broadcast an NBA game or if I have, uh, I think ESPN has the Sunday night NFL games, like that's like my most prized content. I still want to keep it on the linear network uh, because I have broader distribution there. I still have, you know, something like 60 uh, million households. When do I start to shift that premium content onto the digital platform, which is ESPN Plus? That is a very important question. I'm sure they think they somehow, they, they probably have an answer, uh, but uh, if, if I was them, I'd be thinking about that very uh, every day. This just shows uh, the linear. When I say linear, it means uh, TV, uh, just regular TV, right? The stuff that you guys don't watch. Uh, when, I, when I say digital, it's, it means uh, right-hand side. It's the uh, subscribers to ESPN+. Plus. So ESPN+, Plus has now grown to, what, 14.9. So almost 15 million subscribers as of the most recent quarter. And that's a very interesting phenomenon. And their uh, uh, pay TV subscribers have uh, declined, uh, sort of stabilized to 84 million in the most recent uh, uh, fiscal year. Uh, but we expect that the left-hand side bar is gonna continue to decline and the right-hand side will continue to rise. Who has a subscription to ESPN Plus? All right, great. Awesome. Um, almost 50% of the room. Um, that's pretty good. It's those lacrosse games we want to see. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Ivy League is on ESPN+. Plus. Okay, this is kind of a busy slide. Next two are kind of busy, um, but I like to spend a little bit of time on it. So as a, as a sports team owner, I think about the value of our IP, but the, the value of your IP is a function of what the purchaser of your IP uh, can do with, with it, right? The, if they can monetize your IP, then the more they can monetize, the more ways they can monetize, 
the more valuable my IP is. Right now, I may not want to go direct to the consumer. Right? I, I don't have Nets TV, and the NBA doesn't... Well, the NBA has a small effort called NBA TV. That's sort of direct-to-consumer uh, or league pass, but that's not a very widely distributed. They haven't completely put all of their chips into the direct-to-consumer strategy. By and large, they will still rely on the sports networks like ESPN to distribute the content. So it matters to uh, the league and a team owner when we think about how much value our IP can generate, it matters to us to understand the monetization model of what our partners are, are, are doing in terms of monetizing the uh, IP. So ESPN, in the traditional sense, uh, on pay TV, the way they monetize is that they will go out and negotiate with the distributors, with the Comcast of the world. And then the Com Comcast will pay them what is called an affiliate fee. There's a lot of jargon in this business, which half the time I don't understand either, but they just have these weird names. Uh, why is it called an affiliate fee? I don't know. So they call the, uh, they, they pay uh, ESPN, Comcast pays ESPN an affiliate fee on a per subscriber basis. So the Comcast will say, okay, if I have ESPN, carry ESPN in my uh, cable package and 80 million households watch ESPN, then I will pay a lot of value on a subscriber basis to ESPN. That's the basic logic. And then that's the biggest uh, monetization that ESPN gets from the IP that they license from the NBA and from the NFL. So it matters if ESPN gets $9 per subscriber in affiliate fees and multiply that by 80 million subscribers, whatever it is. Uh, then they pretty much have a sense of how much revenue they can generate, which then will inform them when they negotiate with us, with the league, how much to pay for the content, right? So that's, the, that's kind of the value chain. And uh, there's also a model in the pay TV world or, or even broadcast where it's unpaid, uh, it's free TV, broadcast TV, uh, that because you have so many people watching your game, advertising is a very big uh, revenue source. Think about Super Bowl with over 100 million viewers watching the game and the value of advertising is, you know, really big. And how do the advertisers look at that value? Uh, they look at how much exposure do I get um, in terms of uh, impressions. So impressions is just um, uh, how much times the TV will show my ad. Let's say I'm Procter & Gamble, I'm gonna advertise, uh, I don't even know if Old, Sp Old Spice is old, owned by Procter, maybe it's not. I'm Old Spice, all right, I, I wanna advertise Old Spice. And uh, uh, I would say, okay, this, this particular asset, or you know, let's say NFL Super Bowl, uh, they've got 100 million viewers, and I can buy five ad spots uh, per game uh, so I actually can get 500 million exposures, and I'll pay on a you know ex per impression basis, and I'll pay a rate uh, based on that kind of exposure. So as you can see in the advertising model, it's both uh, the your advertising inventory. You can show your TV ad once or five times or ten times per game, right? So that's how much inventory you can buy, uh, and also the reach of the potential audience uh, of the channel. So that's, that's the basic uh, uh, model. So on the one hand, uh, you get affiliate fees on a per subscriber basis. On the other hand, you have advertising revenue that's based on reach and ad inventory. So with the new rise of digital media, some, some things are gonna be quite different in terms of how people look at uh, monetization. On its face, you still have similar sort of economic models or structures of generating subscriber revenue. When you buy a subscription to ESPN Plus or Amazon Video, you're actually paying uh, a fee, a subscription fee, right? Now, what's the difference? If you think about it, the difference is that you, the consumer, 
are directly paying uh, the sports channel or the sports network of, for that fee. In the, pay, in the linear world, the cable subscriber is paying the telco, then who, pay, who then pays ESPN, right? So now, as an ESPN subscriber, you're directly uh, paying ESPN Plus uh, uh, the subscription fee. What does that mean? How, what's the implication of that? It gives ESPN a lot of flexibility in terms of pricing the product, right? And also, they can, they can basically price retail. When they, when they get affiliate fees from a cable operator, they're getting paid a wholesale price uh, because the cable operator still needs to make a margin. But now ESPN can now go direct to the consumer, get retail price, capture that retail margin, uh, and also have more pricing flexibility. They could change the price uh, tomorrow, nine bucks a, uh, a month. I think ESPN Plus is like eight, seven point nine or something like eight, eight or nine dollars a month. They can change that to twelve dollars a month tomorrow, right? You know, if they if they feel like they have pricing power. Whereas affiliate revenue type, affiliate fee type negotiations, they don't happen every day. They happen in you know yearly or or every two or three years. So that's kind of what's happening with this, uh, with this kind of uh, direct-to-consumer uh, model. Another thing that you should also pay attention to that's different in the digital world is that in traditional TV, people look at households. Well, each household may have a lot of members. There's the parents, there's the kids, there's the brother and the sister. So in the digital world, each of you could have an individual subscription. So it's kind of, you're not comparing oranges, you know, you're apples and oranges when you compare households to, to digital subscribers. So you're going to see a lot more digital subscribers than households. I'm sure you want to have a different subscription of Netflix from your parents. Um, when, when you're, you know, you can afford and pay for it, you know, you, you'll, you'll say, thanks very much, but I'll have a different subscription. And, you know, that happens in, you know, that'll happen in sports too, I think. And uh, so, so that's, that's the other uh, big difference. And uh, the th third big difference is interesting from my perspective is, because uh, I've been in the internet business for a long time, 22 years. Alibaba is a consumer facing business and people come to our platform to shop directly on our app. You know, we used to look at in the important metrics in e-commerce obviously is GMV, how much dollar value people transact on our platform, all right? But increasingly, we realize that we actually need to look at timeshare. In other words, let's say a user spends five hours a day on the internet. Let's say they use Instagram or WhatsApp, or and in China it's WeChat and you know uh, the ByteDance uh, apps like Douyin. And if they're capturing all the time and attention from users, then nobody is going to shop on the Alibaba platform. And so for us, and and each user only has a certain number of hours a day that they're on the platform. So uh, so they, you need to really pay attention to your timeshare. Not market share, it's just timeshare. And this is very much of internet thinking, and now that thinking is also factoring into the thinking of uh, a lot of these guys that are launching digital media platforms. So if I'm an Amazon video person, I don't just ask, you know, am I launching the, the shows that people want to watch, or I don't, you know, just ask about uh, my total viewership of a particular show. I'm asking in aggregate, how much time people are spending on my Amazon video watching uh, shows as opposed to like on Netflix? Well, you know, guess what? What's the answer? The answer is that in general entertainment platforms, Netflix has roughly about 50% timeshare, which is much, much more than Amazon, Disney Plus, HBO Max, and all that. And uh, uh, that's, that's gonna be very, very significant. Because why is that? It's because if, if, if you think about it, if people are spending most of their time on your platform, not just watching one show, but three shows, five shows, 
plus sports, plus other things. When it comes time to renew, are they going to renew or not? It, they're actually more likely to renew if they are spending more time on your platform. So a very big uh, part of the metric that people are looking at is, I want to reduce my churn rate. Uh, you know, pe will people continue to renew their subscriptions? So today, Netflix will have a huge advantage because they're, I assume that their churn rate is, is lower than everybody else because people are spending more time on them. The other reason for timeshare is uh, if, you, if you have people just kind of addicted to your platform, you have pricing power. Pricing power is really important because, uh, you know, I want to be able to charge $12 tomorrow where I'm only charging $9 today. Uh, if I have that pricing power, I could, uh, that uplift in terms of, you know, increase incremental revenue. If you think about that incremental revenue, what's the margin of that incremental revenue? It's like 99%. I don't have any cost against that incremental revenue if I just raise prices. So, so these are all the things, uh, you know, if I'm in the digital media world, the way we ought to look at it should be different from when we were in the traditional TV world. So in the past few years, the different sports leagues have renegotiated their media contracts. And the value of their media have increased pretty much close to doubling in all these leagues. And then you have the SEC. That's gone up like almost 6x. It's incredible, right? You know, uh, and also you see that not just the linear partners, not just the TV people are bidding for these assets, but the OTT partners. Amazon Video, very important. Amazon Video has come in and bid for Thursday Night Football from the NFL, and they got the whole deal. So the NFL benefited from all of this interest, and their new deal, which uh, starts in 2023 for, I think it's an 11-year deal, 2023 to 33, has gone up 1.8 times. Uh, it's, so in other words, the NFL, if you think about it, annually, you know, starting from 2023, will start to generate more than $10 billion of revenue from uh, national TV or streaming. That's... There are 32 teams in the NFL, so how much is that per team? That's a lot of money. And, uh, oh, we have a question already. Maybe, yeah. Sure. Yeah, please. Hi, I'm Daniel Nupp, a master's in public health student in healthcare management. Um, I just quickly, like, the question came to mind now, but why do you think that is that every sport has seen this, like, uptick in, um, um, in viewership, why people are interested in watching sports now more than ever? Well, I think the, the intuitive uh, reason is live sports is still uh, content that people want to watch. And this is manifested especially uh, during COVID and, and as we're getting out of COVID. Uh, people are staying at home and uh, the viewership of sports, live, live sports is has continued to grow. So not, not only the TV executives recognize that, but now the streaming media people, the, the likes of Amazon, uh, Netflix, I haven't even mentioned Apple TV, right? Those guys also are paying a lot of attention uh, to that. It's all driven by the consumers, by the, by the uh, uh, user behavior. Um, so I try to explain two key drivers of um, increase to sports media valuations. Uh, so the, the, the first reason is uh, because of the recognition by these uh, media executives that live sports is you know, something people really want to watch, a lot of new entrants are coming into the space. Uh, so in the middle part of this uh, there are the traditional uh, networks and distributors. But on the right-hand side are all the uh, streaming media players they're the, what we call the OTT players. They're over the top because they skip over these guys. We don't need the distributors anymore. They're both the, the, net, the channels that put all this content together and also the distributors themselves. Amazon Video is a perfect example. Netflix is a perfect example. All these guys, uh, you know, you have YouTube TV, 
you know, ESPN Plus, Peacock is part of the NBC empire, Paramount is part of the CBS sports empire. So every single traditional media company now has a digital strategy and they're all launching an app uh, that shows, uh, you know, TV series or sports or both. So lots of new entrants into the space and <laughs> as, uh, uh, you know, I think it's very simple uh, economic theory. If you have more bidders, if you, the difference between one bidder or two bidders for an asset is kind of exponential. But if you have three bidders and four bidders and five bidders, you could definitely play one off against the other, right? So that's, we're sitting here. There are only four sports leagues. Um, I'm trying to make the lacrosse uh, leagues, the NLL Indoor League and the Premier Lacrosse League as one of the fifth, you know, Who's going to be the fifth? I hope lacrosse is going to be uh, the fifth league. Uh, but right now, you're looking at four sports league leagues. They're natural monopolies in a way. Uh, you know, they're not, nobody, nobody's going to come in and create another football league or, or basketball league that's going to be comparable to NFL or in the NBA. So, uh, so the leagues are sitting pretty right now with more and more bidders coming into the space. And the other phenomenon is the increased demand from uh, traditional networks. So what's been happening is because of Netflix and Amazon Video, they've eaten uh, the lunch of all the TV networks. So does anybody watch TV shows on ABC or CBS anymore? I mean, when was the last time you watched a TV show on CBS or NBC? I, what was, uh, I think Friends was on, was Friends on NBC? Was it an NBC show? Anyway, most of you don't even know what Friends is. <laughs> yeah, uh, except when you watch Hulu or something. And anyway, so in traditional TV, nobody is watching shows anymore. So they all have a sense of crisis, all these TV executives. And they say, oh my God, you know, Amazon, Netflix, they have so much cash. They, they, the, the market capitalization of these companies are much, much bigger. They can raise capital. Their cost of capital is much cheaper. So they can plow billions and billions of dollars into production of great TV series. And that's all happening on streaming. And now the traditional TV networks don't have any good shows. So what am I going to get? I'm going to go out and get live sports. So that's, that's another phenomenon that's happening. Uh, where the traditional TV executives have uh, kind of a sense of crisis uh, and, and they're kind of clinging on to live sports as the only content that they can, they can get to keep their customers. Yes, here are some of the quotes of uh, some, uh, some, some of the TV executives. Brian Roberts, chairman of uh, Comcast, he said, we believe in the power of live sports and are confident our multi-platform rights deals we've made will provide us tremendous value now and into the future. So first thing he said is we believe in the power of life sports. What he's really saying is life sports is the only thing that save, is saving us from losing our viewers. And, uh, and then he says we're confident of our multi-platform rights deals. What does that mean? It means that when they go out and try to sign uh, a sports league content, it's, it's going to be displayed on multi-platforms. It's not just going to be on uh, linear TV like NBC. They have Peacock. So uh, I'm in the, in the middle of a number of negotiations where the league is negotiating with, uh, you know, the likes of ESPN and NBC, and they want not just the uh, TV con the content display on TV, but they also want to have the digital media rights. They want to have both and you know, we're saying, well, maybe we'll split it up. Maybe the TV rights go to one party. Maybe the digital rights go to another party. Uh, and we haven't even talked about carving out uh, content that is suitable for betting because uh, sports bettors want to have, uh, also want to watch games live so they can both, uh, you know, watch and, and bet. Uh, so the watch and bet stream could potentially be carved out of these digital media deals. So... All of this is happening uh, at the same time, and uh, it's very, very exciting from, uh, from, our, from my vantage point.
Yeah, this is just the last slide. It's just a very detailed chart of the exactly what's happening to the NFL contract. The NFL is very smart, actually. They, they split the media deals into AFC, NFC, uh, Sunday night. NFC packages are like during the day on Sunday. Uh, and then they have um, Sunday night football, Monday night football, Thursday night football. They also have their own product called the Red Zone, which how many people watch Red Zone? Great. We, 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 uh, so it's like you watch like eight games on the same screen uh, when the ball is in the Red Zone. So it's, you know, it's kind of interesting. And then there's this thing called the Sunday Ticket, which is if you're out of market, you can still watch NFL games um, around the league. Um, and those rights are still uh, not yet, been, they haven't been sold yet uh, in the next round. Uh, so the next big negotiation is how much is the NFL going to get for a Sunday ticket? Uh, so a lot, they kind of slice everything up and divide it up into to the various uh, media companies. You could see on the top is the, what people are paying currently uh, for all these packages, a billion, a billion one. And here, 2.1 billion, which is a doubling, 2.2 billion, also doubling. Sunday night just gone, has just gone from 950 to 2 billion. So, you know, a doubling of all those rights fees. So I feel very fortunate to be in a position to be a, a team owner, effectively owning the IP, and have a lot of parties around us that are interested in our media rights. And uh, so that's my, that's my presentation, and uh, I'd love to open up for questions. Um, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Uh, my name is Zubin Sharma. I'm a master's in public policy student at the Jackson Institute at Yale. Yeah. Um, I had two questions. The first was, uh, why doesn't the NBA just get into the distribution business as well and have its own platform to distribute content? And the second was, as an owner, how do you structure innovation within your own organization, especially given that 50% of your revenue is coming from na uh, national sources, which is split amongst 30 teams? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those are great questions. Uh, the NBA is trying to distribute some of their own content. So there are two efforts uh, within the league office that is, uh, I would say, direct to consumer. Uh, one is NBA TV. Uh, they, they, it's a national uh, TV channel, it's on cable, and, uh, uh, but uh, you don't have a lot of viewers of NBA TV. Uh, today, all the best games are on ESPN and TNT. So what, you know, do they want to like, cut off what they have now, which they're getting a lot of money on, and shift all the best games on NBA TV? That's a huge risk to take. So it's your classic, uh, issue of uh, kind of I have a legacy structure where I'm making a lot of money so am I brave enough to innovate and do something totally different maybe piss off some of my existing partners and do it myself and still generate the same kind of economics as before that that's a that's what's happening and tell you what to be honest I mean I think the you know if you talk to people in the league office they're also trying to figure it out uh, the other product they have on, on uh, digital is uh, League Pass. I don't know if you're a subscriber to League Pass. It basically gives you all the uh, out-of-market games. Uh, so, for example, here, if you're a, a Golden State Warrior fan, uh, you can watch the Golden State Warriors here in Connecticut um, on, League, on League Pass. That's, a, uh, that's an app, so it's a digital platform. Uh, so they're, that's still relatively small today. Uh, again, they're thinking... Is there a way to create a bigger League Pass so everybody can be on it? But if, if they showed all the games on League Pass, they will antagonize their local uh, regional sports network. Like here, I think you get access to the Yes Network to watch uh, Brooklyn Nets. And uh, what do we do about the Yes Network, who is our, you know, our partner? So again, we're in the 
in, in a stage of huge transition. We're kind of in flux and everybody's trying to figure out how do we go from point A to point B and you know, crossing the chasm without falling into the valley. So that's, that's what's happening right now. To your second question about organization, yeah, so obviously we don't have a division that deals with ESPN because Adam Silver, the league office, deals with ESPN, but uh, we have a team of uh, tickets, you know, ticketing uh, division uh, that sells tickets. Uh, nowadays, most of the tickets are being sold online, so we have to go through a partner, right? Uh, either Ticketmaster or SeatGeek. So if you look at the Brooklyn Nets, we just recently signed a new deal with SeatGeek. We switched partners from Ticketmaster to SeatGeek, so now you can buy Brooklyn Nets t tickets on SeatGeek. Um, a little, little advertising. Um, uh, so we have a whole ticketing department. We have a depart uh, department that deals with sponsorships. Uh, what's sponsorships? Well, jersey patch. What do we, uh, we're allowed to display a brand on our jersey. So we recently signed a jersey patch deal. Uh, that's a company called Webull. Uh, what do they do? They are one of the uh, stock trading apps, just like Robinhood. Uh, so that's kind of uh, uh, you know, a pretty hot uh, sector to be in. And then we have uh, suite sales, uh, you know, not just selling seats, but these uh, corporate suites that we sell to corporate customers and things like that. So it's organized around that. But one important thing um, within our organization, and I think also within every MBA organization, is to not just look at the business end, but also look at how uh, the team is, you know, uh, a part of the community, part of the culture of Brooklyn. And so we're very mindful of that. Uh, we're also very mindful of our diversity and inclusion programs, both in terms of uh, the people that work for the organization, but also our suppliers. We're trying to diversify our supplier base. Uh, uh, you know, the caterers, the people that come in to um, uh, provide, uh, let's say, food services and stalls within the arena um, are uh, the, the people that are the hourly wage workers that work within the uh, Barclays Center. So these are all the things that we try to do, uh, pay a lot of attention to, rather than just generating revenue, right? It's very important because we're part of the community. Yep, please. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, really uh, appreciate your presentation. I learned a lot today, especially the timeshare concept. And uh, my name is Arthur Zhang. I'm in B school from Shanghai yeah. Fudan University. In the meantime, I'm studying Master of Advanced Management in Yale SOM. And my question is, you've mentioned a lot of OTT player, like uh, Disney+, Plus, Amazon Video, YouTube TV. Um, do you think there, in this market, do they have space for the new entrepreneurs, especially for small, small individual or self, self media, or mm. or student at the high center. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, for sure. I think there's room, even though you have like these uh, uh, platforms, ESPN Plus, Disney Plus, that are owned by giant corporations. Uh, if you think about. Uh, how young people consume content and consume media, uh, they may not sit down and watch a game three hours. They may just watch highlights. You know, you have already, I mean, for example, on TikTok, you already have a ton of entrepreneurs that will take uh, whatever content they create and put it on TikTok. It's very, very creative, right? Today, is there room for new entrepreneurs to, uh, let's say invent a, a platform, an app, let's say on mobile, that'll uh, generate lots and lots of users. Uh, I think it's certainly more difficult than it was 10 years ago, but I don't think it's in, uh, impossible. I think it's definitely possible that someone can be very creative, find, figure out a way to get that user attention, uh, to uh, acquire users at cheap cost and, and and, and grow uh, timeshare. I, I think there's definitely room for that. You just have to be creative. Sir, over there. Thanks for the chat. Uh, my name is Gary Stewart. I'm a visiting professor of entrepreneurship at Yale Law School, yeah. and I have two questions. Uh, first question is, 
you've done like a lot of different careers, you know, from being a lawyer to then kind of being a tech entrepreneur in China mostly, and now coming back to the US and doing digital media. Like, are there transferable skills that you can kind of share? Like, how do you get success in such different industries? And then the second question would be, why won't, and when you deal with the internet, usually the winner takes all. So why won't Amazon, if they have enough money or Facebook or whomever, just basically say, we're just going to buy up all of our competitors just as we do in every other industry and ultimately consolidate and own the end user so that they can stay on our platforms even longer? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, transferable skills. Uh, I, I think a couple of things. Um, I'm, a, uh, I'm actually a detail-oriented guy. Uh, so no matter what you do, whether it's in law or venture capital or being operating a business or even a sports team owner, uh, at the end of the day, uh, you, you need to operate. You need to un really under get to understand the business. When I first came into the Brooklyn Nets, I knew nothing about the sports business. So I invested the time to learn. And now I feel like I can actually you know, gain some insight and you know, even though we have professional management in place that run uh, both the business side, the basketball side, I can't. I, I just, I'm, you know, I, I won't be able to deal with that. But at least on the business side, how do you sell tickets? How do you sell sponsorships? All those questions, I believe I can have some value add because I do pay attention to the details and I try to understand the, the, the inner workings. I mean, when you approach a business question, you're always asking, do we have the right economic structure? Do we have positive unit economics uh, for this thing to work? And I think those are the relevant questions to ask. The other thing about sort of the common trait or whatever you, you bring to the table is everything you do, you just have to have a sense of humility. You have to, you have to know that uh, you're not gonna be the smartest guy in the room. Somewhere, sometimes somebody else is gonna be smarter than you are and you try to seek out uh, the people that are smarter than you are and try to hire them. <laughs> um, I, you know, and, and this works all the time. I just don't think a CEO or a leader can be successful if they can't hire people that are smarter than they are uh, because the organization's uh, potential is limited by the individual's abilities. Um, so that's... Uh, I think that's very, very important. What's your next question? Sorry. The that in the internet, winner takes all, why won't uh, uh, winner they apply all. the same principle? Yeah, yeah. I, so I'll give you an example, kind of a, um, well, without going into names and particular individuals or the industry, but, um, I, you know, Amazon is in this gigantic business, right? But what about the business of selling merchandise uh, a, a licensed merchandise, uh, you know, NBA jerseys and things like that. To Amazon, it's such a tiny business uh, in their huge empire. So uh, we actually know people and companies that took that business and created a whole uh, niche of that business and created a moat around that business. And they were able to use the position that they have to sign very favorable deals from all the sports leagues, which created a further moat. Uh, and why? It's because big companies, when there's a tiny opportunity, they may not pay too much attention to it. And there's, so there's room for entrepreneurs to you know, identify sort of niche opportunities and, cr and make it very, very big. But because once you, you take a niche opportunity to something that's bigger, then you have a platform, then you can expand into other categories. And uh, I think Amazon's e-commerce business, even though they're very, very strong, uh, over time may be disrupted by, uh, you know, category by category by other players. Uh, and why? It's because the way consumers engage with the platform is evolving as well. Uh, you're gonna have people that are only buying things on a uh, streaming video platform. Uh, they don't go to an app to just uh, uh, look up a catalog of things. They don't use search. Uh, so uh, consumer behavior is evolving. Uh, that leaves room for disruption.
Hi, um, yes, I'm Isabel Webster. I'm a senior on the women's lacrosse team here studying psychology and emotional intelligence. My question was just about um, in terms of your work with the PLL, um, the San Diego SEALs, if you could elaborate on your experience with that um, in terms of the challenges or opportunities you foresee with regards to digital media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, it, it's lacrosse, so I love to talk about lacrosse. <laughs> um, so the PLL is the outdoor league, uh, and the NLL is the indoor league. It's box lacrosse. So there are just so many differences. It's, it's really fascinating. It, well, first thing is 80% uh, of the people in the indoor league are still from Canada. So one of the things that we're trying to do is to populate the indoor lacrosse, box lacrosse in the United States. I love to talk to Andy about it because um, I know you, do, you have introduced a lot of the indoor game into the uh, field game. Because I don't think the league uh, will be successful unless we have more American players in the indoor game. The other big difference between the PLL and the NLL is the PLL is a single entity league, meaning that nobody owns the teams other than the, the league itself. So the league owns all the eight teams in the uh, PLL. And then every weekend, the eight teams descend upon the city to play like a tournament style weekend. Uh, and then they go from city to city. Now that's kind of a, uh, you know, a, a little bit of an unwieldy structure, you know, with traveling and organization. Uh, but the advantage of a single entity league is that in some of the big moves now with media negotiations, signing, for example, a partner in cryptocurrency or sports betting or something like that, the league can move very fast. The management of the league, which is led by Paul Rabel and his brother Mike, they could just you know, decide what they want to do. That you know, we have a board structure, so important things come to the board. But by and large, the board is very supportive of the entrepreneurs. So the PLL is much, much more entrepreneurial, especially capturing these new opportunities that's brought about by the new trends. Whereas the NLL, very traditional sports structure, uh, 15 teams in the league, and every team gets a vote. Nobody can agree on anything, uh, which is a challenge. Uh, but uh, you know, we're, we're trying to make sure that the league as a whole can move uh, forward to try to capture some of these new opportunities. Uh, but it's fascinating. I, I just love, I love both. I mean, I'm just a fan of both games. So uh, I'll, I'll go to any game. Yeah. But, and with, speaking of women's lacrosse, there's uh, a new league, I think, uh, that's starting. I met the people that uh, are doing this, but I haven't really had a, real substantial discussion with them, but I'd love to see if, you know, if I can help. Yeah. Sir. Oh, okay. Yeah, go, go ahead. Hi, my name is Prerak. I'm an MD MBA student here. Yeah. Um, two questions. You have a lot of money. Uh, so of all the things <laughs> you could have invested in, um, why like an MBA team? You know, like what was the thinking in terms of like, Maybe you're interested in it, or maybe you saw something promising, kind of what we talked about. And the second thing is, as the MD side of my background, with COVID, the Warriors have mandated vaccinations, I think, for, I don't know if the whole team or not, but is this something that, I know Kyrie's been very uh, outspoken on this issue. Um, so as the owner, where do you, not you stand, but where, how do you approach COVID this upcoming year, um, mm. where we're going back to normalcy and you know, trying to figure out everything out? Yeah, yeah. Well, why I invested in the team? Uh, it, it's like one activity where I can enjoy it personally, I can enjoy it with my family, and at the same time, the assets can appreciate in value if we put in the work. So where else are you going to get a confluence of all of that, right? And, uh, and, and also it brings joy to the fans. I, you know, nothing makes me happier than, I mean, I was in game seven of the series against the Bucks. And man, when Kevin Durant made that shot, the whole building just exploded. And then the disappointment after people found out that it's only a two point shot, not a three pointer. So, but you know, just to see the fans, you know, loving the game, uh, 
that makes me really happy. So it's both, so it's like, it's very rare when you can find something where you can both make money and also uh, enjoy it yourself and also feel like you're contributing actually to your community. Uh, I think the Brooklyn fans love the Nets. Um, I hope they continue to love us. <laughs> so uh, your, uh, your second question is about the COVID. Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, so I really want to give credit to the league office, to Adam Silver and his team for uh, actually, you know, we had 20, the 2020 season was the bubble. Uh, we finished off that season. And then last season, we had no fans in the building for most of the season. Uh, and then during pay playoffs, we slowly let fans back in. Uh, and we've been able to manage that really, really well uh, with the right, it's with the right protocol. I mean, the NBA protocols are so strict uh, that you wouldn't believe. I mean, they, they're testing players every day. If I go to a game, uh, if I'm sitting courtside, I have to wear a mask, right? So there's very strict protocol to make sure that uh, we are uh, uh, minimizing the risk of a uh, spread of the virus. Now with vaccine, the, the NBA itself cannot mandate every player, everybody get vaccinated. And that's because it's a issue that needs to be collectively bargained with the Players Association. So that issue is still, you know, the Players Association has not decided that they want to require everybody to get vaccinated. I hope they get there at some point. But what's been happening with Golden State and also with New York, you know, both the Knicks and the Nets is both city uh, mayors have issued a mandate that if you come inside into the building, um, w whether you're a fan or a worker or a player, uh, you need to be vaccinated. So the city law trumps whatever rule that applies to the NBA. So we will have to follow the city law. It's a little bit uh, uneven application because you know Philadelphia doesn't have that rule. Uh, so if you have non-vaccinated players on the Sixers or in Boston, they could play within their arena, home arena. But our players that are unvaccinated cannot play at Barclays Center today. And if someone visits Barclays, like Right, so, from, so, with that indirectly so they made an exception for performers that come in, performers uh, that, that are based out of town are exempt. That's the only exemption. Uh, that's the rule. Uh, but, you know, look, I think we're, we're living through extraordinary times. People are making up rules. Like, the rules are never going to be fair to everybody. Uh, but the good thing is, I think governments are, are, have figured out uh, rules and compromises that will protect most of the people. And I happen, personally, I happen to believe in the vaccine because I know it works. Uh, I have taken two kinds of vaccine. When I was in Hong Kong, I took Sinovac, which is the Chinese manufactured vaccine, uh, two doses there. And then when I got to the US in June, I took the Pfizer, again, two doses. I've got four shots in me now. And everywhere I go, I feel very, very safe. Um, so, uh, you know, I, so get vaccinated. I mean, it works. I, I know it works. It's the science. Sir. Uh, thank you for speaking with us. My name is Matt Elkin. I work with the men's basketball team here. Um, so one of the biggest challenges during the pandemic was fans weren't able to come to games. Yeah. Um, and we we're talking about digital media and things. So are there any trends that you see to kind of engage fans? Um, because there's nothing like the fan experience, going to a game, taking your family, stuff like that. Um, are there things, virtual reality or other ways that you can, that you foresee people engage fans from home? Um, to kind of mimic that fan experience that you would get from coming to an arena, but doing it more in a digital way. Any trends that you, that you see coming up in that regard? Yeah, virtual reality is definitely uh, something that will continue to grow. Uh, I think more and more people will want to have that experience of sitting anywhere, but feel like you're sitting in, uh, have a courtside seat in the arena. Now, having said that, I think you will find that a lot of those experiences are still very individual. I mean, look, 
if you're actually in the arena, you can actually high five someone next to you when Kevin Durant scores a basket. But if you're on a virtual reality headset, you're sitting by yourself and you're not having that experience with your friends or your family. Uh, so there's still something lacking. I think what COVID taught us is there's nothing that can replace in-person interaction. So you, you know, uh, you don't want to go to the other extreme and everybody just sort of had a, has a headset and not interacting with other people, right? But definitely, I think virtual reality is going to be a, a, a very interesting trend. I think the application of virtual reality, uh, you know, when you watch an NBA game or NFL or whatever, it's, it's, you're, you're just consuming the content, you're receiving the content. It's not as in interactive as it, as it can be. Like, let's say if you were playing a video game, then that's very interactive. So I see more application of virtual reality in video gaming um, where, there's, where the activity is more interactive. Sir. Hi, Mr. Tsai. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I'm Jack He. Uh, I'm a Master of Science student in Biostatistics at Yale, Uni Yale Graduate School of Art and Science. I'm also a co-founder of iTalent, a uh, HR tech startup, came from Thai City, so thank you very much for the support and donation. It helped our venture a lot. So then come to my question. Actually, I have, I've got two questions. So my startup is focused on AI, but beyond AI, I also focused on blo blockchain industry. Mm -hmm. So you also talk about blockchain and, uh, industry at the very beginning. You will yeah. talk about more in the later sessions. So my first question is that, what do, you, what do you think about the future applications of blockchain in sports industry? I know you paid one of the players to use Bitcoin last year. Do you think there will be like, more applications of blockchain in the sports industry? And my second question is that, what do you think about block, uh, a blockchain industry overall within and beyond uh, sports industry? Will there be enterprises like Alibaba, Google, Amazon in the blockchain industry? Because right now, there are just too many companies doing different applications. Will be some dominant companies coming out in the future in blockchain industry? Yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Uh, so I will maybe do a, uh, an advertisement for my session on October 26th, when I'll spend like a full hour or two hours on the blockchain applications in sports. Uh, but you know, you can you can imagine using uh, the idea of um, blockchain-based tokens uh, to reward your fans. So if you had a token, it'll entitle you to fan privileges when you come into the building, like a free t-shirt or something like that. So there are a lot of uh, things uh, that could come out of the blockchain uh, space. Um, I think the whole idea of blockchain is uh, digital ownership of something, uh, whether it's a privilege or it's a right or, or art or, you know, or just a token that you could trade. And, and it's, it doesn't matter what the asset is that you own but the fact that you own it digitally, that's on a blockchain, that is verifiable and immutable and not confiscatable by anybody, not by your parents or by, uh, by the school or by the government or anybody. And that's, that's kind of the essence of blockchain. But I'll cover that you know, in a few weeks if you come to the class um, on the 26th. Sir. So uh, th thanks for sharing, Joe. Uh, so, so I'm a uh, first year MBA student. My name is Edward Wong. And uh, like before MBA, I, I was doing investment banking and like Alibaba was my client. Yeah. Uh, so my, my question is, as you are like a very, 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 very successful uh, investor, as well as a uh, very successful uh, entrepreneur. So what do you think, uh, like which industry do you think has the most potential in the in the future, like like which in, which industry are you interested in make making your next investment? I mean, nowadays we see like AIs, like in electronic cars, we see machine learning. There are like so many new technologies coming forth again and again. So like many people, like many bankers, who are just get lost. We we just don't know like what will be the next era of the new opportunity. So. <laughs> Thanks. That's a very big question. I'm trying to figure that out myself. Uh, you know, I think 
you know, having done, ha having seen the growth of a company like Alibaba, um, I I'm a big believer in uh, consumer-facing technologies and in, in also in the ingenuity and creativity of consumers to create new, new use cases uh, for technology. In fact, today, Claire, we were talking about with Angelica about uh, the National Science Foundation um, is going to create a new entity to put more funding into not just the study of base, basic science, but also the use cases that leverage scientific discoveries. Uh, so the government, the US government, is getting into the business of you know, inventing use cases. And I thought to myself, you know, I, I think that's the job of the private sector, right? It's the Facebooks and the Amazons, the Instagrams of the world to create that. But interesting that the government is also getting into it. So but I'm a very big believer in, uh, you know, scaling consumer-facing platforms. But I don't view blockchain or AI as industries. Uh, I think they're enabling technologies uh, that can enable uh, a consumer-facing business. And uh, today, you, you know, I mean, if you look at AI, there's just multiple thousands of applications of AI in, in, in consumers, you know, from TikTok to even Amazon is using AI to recommend, you know, what you should be buying. So, uh, so I, th I would still look at those uh, businesses that could scale very fast with consumers. At the end of the day, I, I don't, that's not my first question. I don't ask what industry should I be in. I ask which entrepreneurs I should back. Uh, I want to identify uh, the, the entrepreneurs with potential, entrepreneurs with passion. Uh, so in a way, my investment philosophy is I back people rather than ideas. So that's, that's just my personal philosophy. Oh, there, yeah, we have one more. We have two more. Yeah. Hello, thanks for having us here. And my name is Melissa, and I am the first year student from Discover Management. Yeah, I built up several brands with Alibaba.com, and I can see that we grow our business with Alibaba together. But for now, the situation has become very, a little bit complicated for me. So as a brand owner, uh, who have the uh, flagship store in Alibaba.com. We are wondering that, what's the next way for Alibaba.com? Is Alibaba.com is trying to uh, expand their business to overseas, head to care head with the uh, Amazon.com, or Alibaba.com is trying to go deeper to China market? So that's my questions. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I know we're off topic a little bit, but I still ac appreciate the question. Uh, I, I think it's very difficult now, given the geopolitical situation, uh, for either for companies from either country to operate in the other country in a consumer-facing manner. Uh, that's because uh, both countries have concerns on data privacy, data security, uh, and things like that. Uh, so, so for Alibaba, the next uh, phase is to uh, continue to grow our business in China. Uh, and as you know, I mean, the way I look at the China, Chinese consumer market is it's almost like three different markets. Uh, you have uh, the market that are, uh, you know, around 400 million people are middle class consumers. Uh, they live in Shanghai, they live in big cities like Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen. And uh, their behavior and their expectations are no different from American consumers, really. But then you have another group of, let's say, around 500 million consumers that are coming from uh, lower tier cities, lesser developed cities, but nevertheless, they're, they're cities, right? Uh, and as you know, some of the smaller cities in China still have like half a million or a million people. That's just incredible. There's, there's over 160 cities in China that have a population of more than a million people, okay? 
And the United States, there's about 10, 10 cities, okay, that have more than a million. So, uh, so that sort of rising segment that are not exactly in the middle class, uh, that's, that has been our focus over the last three, four years. We're penetrating into those markets, um, which is not easy. But then you have another segment. It's also like f around four or 500 million people in the rural villages, and they are migrant workers. They come to the cities to serve uh, the middle class, if you will. Like, you know, if you, nowadays you can order Starbucks in China on, on, on an app and someone delivers it to you, right? And who's, who's going to be the guy that delivers the Starbucks coffee? It's going to be someone from a remote village that has migrated into the big city to make a living, to improve their income and maybe send some money home, right? So you have that segment of users. So China is a very big country. I think by staying in China and segment your users and targeting them to what they want, uh, what they like, I think is, is, is the right strategy. So that's where we are. Sir. Hello, um, I'm Mateo Rice, um, a freshman undergraduate student, a prospective um, psychology major on the basketball team. Um, and my question is more about uh, the social aspect of your work with the Brooklyn Nets. Um, so uh, from my understanding, uh, the NBA is a you know, very good social standing um, in terms of social justice issues and just engagement in the community compared to the NFL or the MLB or um, you know, other major sports leagues or corporations in the, in the US. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, you know, what role, if any, do you play in any social uh, aspects of the Brooklyn Nets? And, you know, what importance do you see, um, if any, um, in the NBA standing, um, you know, socially, maybe not like economically as much, but, you know, socially um, uh, in the role uh, of the U.S.? Um, I am, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, I don't claim to uh, be the most proactive person in, in, in social causes and, uh, and, and all of that, uh, but I, I would try to incorporate kind of that social, socially responsible and social consciousness into everything I do, all right? I'm just speaking sort of philosophically, right, about kind of social responsibility and social justice. Like, I'm always skeptical if companies have, like, a department that's called social responsibility department that just does their thing and not incorporate uh, the ideas of social responsibility into their whole business model. And I think Alibaba was, has always been founded with a view that everything we do should be to solve societal problems, whether it's job creation or helping small businesses. Uh, and obviously, in this country, we have... Uh, a lot of divisions uh, because of racial tension, and that's a that's a social issue on its own, which you know we don't have that in in China. So coming to the Brooklyn Nets, we care a lot about you know just within our organization, how do we incorporate uh, diversity into our organization? I believe that uh, having that diversity makes your organization better because. You, have, you bring in different perspectives and different views uh, into the organization. And a free economy is all about competition for the best ideas. If you're not incorporating views from the broadest base of individuals, you're not going to get the best ideas rising to the top. So, so I think that's, that's how I think about it. Uh, my wife and I have actually created a, a, a fund uh, you know, we call it the Social Justice Fund uh, to do things in Brooklyn. Uh, one of the first thing, first programs that we uh, launched uh, is to provide loans uh, to minority-owned businesses uh, for them to uh, restart after COVID. And uh, we're giving out, uh, you know, smaller, smaller loans for recovery loans uh, of $10,000. Or we also look at uh, people with longer term plans, then we can lend up to like $100,000. And that loan program is, uh, we just started it uh, about six months ago. 
and uh, we want to support minority-owned businesses in Brooklyn. Uh, that's one of the things we, we, we do. The other thing that I'm doing that has uh, not really a lot to do with uh, uh, the Brooklyn Nets is um, I'm one of the founding board members of the Asian American Foundation. Uh, you know, we created this uh, organization to address the issue, the issue of anti-Asian hate crimes. Uh, and, you know, this is, this is just a phenomenon that we are facing in society. And um, uh, I think there's a lot of work to do on this particular uh, issue. Uh, some of the root causes of, uh, you know, sort of hate crimes against Asians is, if you look at the history, um, Asian Americans have actually been scapegoated in throughout history, uh, you know, back when uh, in the 1800s, when a lot of Chinese immigrants came and built railroads in America, uh, uh, people here felt that they were starting to take jobs away from um, from everybody else, and then they uh, created a law that excluded Chinese immigration, specifically people from China, right? Um, you know, during World War II. Uh, after Pearl Harbor, Japanese Americans were viewed as untrustworthy. So they, they were full, you know, full-blooded American citizens, and they were sent to these camps so that they could be uh, uh, kind of locked up and, and not uh, considered to not threaten society. <laughs> and, uh, and these are some of the uh, things in history that, you know, it's a painful part of uh, the history of the country. It's a painful part of the history for Asian Americans. Um, you know, I want to contribute my resources to uh, try to correct that problem. I think a lot of the issues revolve around perception and a change of the narrative. We need to change the narrative and educate uh, the general public about the history of Asian Americans. Um, so that's, that's the other thing uh, that I'm doing. I, I just think that, you know, bottom line is, you know, everything you do should have a sense of social responsibility baked into your, whether you're doing a business or you're in academics or, or, or anything. It's just, um, it's just so important. Sir. Hello, thanks for your great talk. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so my name is Robert, and I'm a master's student in computer science. Yeah. And I got into Tai City student program this year uh, with my mental health startup. And I have a simple question, but it can be an open-ended a big one. So let's back to our topic. What's the, what, what's, what's the difference between the sports market in China and US? And what can Chinese CBA can learn, learn from the NBA? Yeah, it's a simple question. Uh, don't get me started. This is like the source of my frustration of well, first, the difference between sports here and sports in China. So, um, you know, I have kids, right? They, uh, my kids actually grew up in Hong Kong, and then, you know, eight years ago, my, my wife moved all the kids to the, uh, to the States in San Diego. So they are pretty athletic. They participate in sports. So here in this country, I don't think you can find a single parent that does not want their kids to play sports. And when you get involved in some of the higher level sports like club sports and lacrosse or you know, AAU basketball, they're like crazy parents. And they're, they're crazy because they want their kids to do well in sports. They're supporting their kids. And they believe that sports will make their kids you know, better human beings, uh, you know, teach them values about life. So that's really ingrained in the culture here. In China, it's the opposite. It's like, if I encourage my kids to do sports, they're, they're not gonna get A's in school and they're gonna crash in academics and not gonna spend the time studying and all that, you know, so parents actually don't encourage their kids to play sports. Uh, which I don't agree with. Uh, I have a philanthropic effort in China to promote uh, school principles uh, that promote sports programs in, in China, uh, in, in, in middle school and also in high schools. 
because uh, I want to I want to populate, uh, you know, make sports more popular in, in, in China. I think you have to work on the par parents, and I think it's a generational thing. So, what's the problem that's created by this? The problem is this: in every sport development in China, you look at the United States, whether it's football, basketball, lacrosse, whatever it is, you have a broad base. It's a pyramid structure because you have broad participation amongst kids and then they, you know, the, the elite players sort of rise to the top. In China, it's not a pyramid, it's a cylinder. The cylinder ends in a pencil point, okay? So there's no, there's no base of talent that's coming into the space. And the government gets involved very early to identify, like if you're three years old and they say, oh, I think you're gonna grow up to be as tall as Yao Ming, you know, based on our measurements, whatever it is. And then they get sent away to sports school. It, it becomes a completely separate structure, uh, right, as, as you know. So, you know, it's not, like here, at Yale, I love Yale because you have athletes, you have like, you know, elite athletes that could also get a great education. You can do both. And uh, uh, in China, that's not the case. Either you're an athlete, which then you're considered to, you know, be like, you're not going to be very successful in academics, so you might as well do, do, you know, do athletics. That's just the wrong approach. So, I mean, don't get me started. I'm very, very upset at the whole system in, 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 in China. And, um, uh, but you know, I, I think uh, with time, things will change and parents' uh, attitudes will change. Because I, I think, you know, people will start to realize you learn so much in sports. Uh, you know, obviously you have teamwork, you have uh, determination, discipline, and all of those. But I think the most important thing about sports is you learn how to bounce back from a setback. And again, in China, how do you get into university? It's that goal call. It's that one test that determines your life. If you failed at that one test, you're screwed. You're screwed for the entire life. So it doesn't leave an opportunity for you to suffer setbacks and bounce back. Whereas I think here in sports, you, you learn to bounce back from setbacks. I always say that if you lost, before you even think about like how am I gonna you know, play in the next game, you have to worry about the next practice. Next practice, uh, Coach Shea, you, you know, it's, it's, that's the mentality, right? You know, it, there is a, pr actually, you don't just bounce back. There's a process of getting back on track uh, after a setback. You learn all of that in sports. You don't learn that in taking tests. Um, and so, don't get me started. I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, that's why, you know, I, Fine, I mean, I think China will still produce uh, Olympic athletes in individual uh, events like diving, gymnastics. I mean, you can like, you can take the cylinder approach, uh, but team sports, you gotta have a broad-based approach. Soccer, basketball, you know. That's why I do not expect China will create, uh, will produce the next NBA player at least for another 10 years unless the system changes. Sir. So um, over the past year, China has been you know, cracking down on your business and your stocks have been going down for like the past year by I think like 50% by now. So how have you been dealing with that kind of, I guess, toll on your business and how have you been, I guess, trying to recover from like this pressure and like the issues that you're facing on like, I guess, the deconstruction of your business is somewhat. Uh, sorry, you're talking about what kind of pressure? From like the government as like the regulations that are on the business and like how that's been affecting you as like, I guess, on the growth and, you know, kind of still bouncing back from that. Yeah, I mean, I think you learn in business, there are ups, ups and downs. You can't uh, win every game, right? Uh, and there, you're gonna go through phases where there's uh, heavy regulation, uh, heavy competition, setbacks. Uh, so I think the key thing is to really understand yourself, understand what you're good at, and also understand what the company's mission is. Uh, you know, at Alibaba, we were founded because we wanted to help small business. 
Um, uh, we have a saying, uh, our mission is to make it easy to do business anywhere. And implicit in that mission is helping small businesses to go around the globe, to do any business anywhere. We're, you know, companies like uh, Google, Amazon, Walmart, they don't need our help. The big companies don't need So we want to make it easy. So, so if we stick to our knitting, stick to our mission, uh, I think we can create a lot of business opportunities, uh, create value for our customers, uh, and then in the process also create value for ourselves. So I think you really need to, what, when you are faced with a setback, you need to really ask yourself, what are you good at? What's your core competency that you've developed over time that you, that you still have the moat uh, that you could you know, execute within that moat and, and become successful again? Uh, so entrepreneurs never die. They, they always bounce back. <laughs> All right? All right. Well, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking Joe Tsai. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.